This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When a life is at risk, there's no time to waste and no room for error. I'm William Shatner. Tonight on Rescue 911, true stories of caring people who open their hearts to those in need. We begin on August 18th, 1992, on the island of Maui, Hawaii. As Angela Campos was getting ready for work and her husband and five-year-old daughter were setting off to spend the day together. My husband, Popo, and my daughter, Sandra, they love to go fishing. Hi, you get everything? Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Mom. My husband and my daughter, they're both alike in a lot of ways. They both have big hearts. They both have very giving natures. They're always joking with each other, conning around. When we continue. I said, is anybody alive? And they go, yeah. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, you're kidding. How can anyone be alive in this? When a semi-tractor truck overturned onto a compact car, it crushed the vehicle and buried it under more than 20 tons of sand. Passing motorist J.R. Hawaii and a friend witnessed the accident and stopped to see if they could help. All I saw was this truck, and then I went around the truck and looked if it hit any car or if anybody else got hurt. That's when I noticed that he did hit a car. I totally think he, the person is dead because the car is flat. Someone's alive! And I totally freaked out and started digging sand. Janet Bostick, who was four months pregnant, also pulled over to help. I said, is anybody alive? And they go, yeah. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, you're kidding. There's, how can anyone be alive in this? 911. Yes, we, there's an accident by, um... A truck turn over on the car. Need assistance right away. Yeah. Any injuries? I think so. There's a car smash. A truck is over the car. Are you okay in there? Just instantly, people started coming up. And one guy asked me, you know, what's wrong? And I said, just dig sand because there's a little girl in there and I can hear her crying. <laughs> Now as I cleared away the sand, I could see that the windshield was smashed down on this little shoulder and the back of the head, and I could see long hair. And all I could think of was, God, they can't breathe. 
And they're like, be careful, all the glass. And I'm like thinking, if she doesn't get some air, she's going to die anyway. So I just grabbed the windshield, pulled it up. Stand away from here. Stand away from the door open. She's like a doll. You know, one leg is bent back and the other leg's forward. The mirror is on her lap. And I just didn't think that she would be okay. Watch your foot. And then we heard this man yelling out that he needed air. I totally freaked out. I was just worried, is like, is he still intact? Is his, is his body still one piece? Within seven minutes of the call, an international life support rescue unit arrived on the scene, including paramedic Mark Schaefer. My first gut reaction was, if there's anybody in there, their chances of survival are very slim, very slim. Okay. My worst thought was that we weren't going to be able to remove this trailer in time and that uh, people would deteriorate right in front of you. Gotta get that door open. Watch the glass. We took the door off and that enabled us to see a little bit more, but we still realized we couldn't move until the tractor trailer was taken off of the car. Move your neck right now, okay? Try to hold still as much as you can. We're going to put a little collar on your neck. Good girl. You're doing really good. The father, at that point, uh, until we removed the passenger door, we could not see him. Once we got the door off, I could actually stick my head partway into the vehicle and just see the his scalp. Oh it's okay. We're going to get you she out. She probably felt so helpless and um, probably thought she was going to die. She probably thought, this is it. You know? After we stabilized her as much as we could, we tried to talk to the, to the father at that point. His condition was even more of a mystery to us. Three minutes after the first rescue unit, the Maui Fire Department arrived, and Captain Conrad Ventura took charge of the scene. Those trucks carry somewhere around 20 tons when loaded. So I figured that we probably are going to need some heavy equipment. Miss, do you have confirmation on anything, uh, any heavy, heavy equipment arriving? When EMT Doug Van Grunewald and his partner got to the scene, they were assigned to treat the father. The greatest fear is that we wouldn't get the trailer off soon enough. The chance that we had might slip away. The front end loader came on the scene in about 10 minutes after I got there, and I consider that great timing. The operator of the front end loader just happened to be my uncle, so it was really easy. I just told me, Uncle, no worry, I'll tell you exactly what I want you to do. So kind of like I had that situation under control. As we were setting up, the mobile crane showed up. We kind of have the mercy of the operator when they bring something on the scene. I asked him, I said, you think this crane is capable of doing this? And he goes, yeah. But I was concerned for the cable, not knowing what condition that cable was in, how much stress it had been under. And I kept thinking, thing is going to fall off and smash the guy twice. Okay, guys, we're ready to lift this thing up, so I want everybody back. Get all the stuff that was part of the can back. Now, wait till we get it off, and I tell you guys, you can go ahead back in.
after the crane pulled the tractor trailer off the car, then we basically could see her whole body. At that point, her leg, which, which I suspected was, was broken very badly, she straightened out on her own. And uh, that, that made me feel good. That, that was a sign that, well, maybe she didn't have as serious injuries as we thought. Five-year-old Sandra had been underneath a 20-ton truck for nearly an hour. Paramedic Diana Gunther still had no idea what condition the girl's father was in. But we pulled the windshield back, and I really expected to have somebody that was dead or near dying, or at least had significant injuries enough that we need to be in the hospital yesterday, we need to get up to surgery now. Sometimes when you remove the metal off of a victim, because there's no pressure anymore on them, whatever, they start bleeding, and they could bleed to death. Yeah. Okay, on a count of three. Okay, head out first. Head out first. The crowd was quite cooperative the entire way, but once we got Popo clear of the vehicle, they erupted into a, a loud cheer. It was wonderful. It was a great feeling. It really was. Angela Campos had driven by the accident on her way to work, but had no idea that her husband and daughter were involved. I got into work late, and my boss is like right there. She goes, no, I don't want you to get excited, but Sandra and Popo have been in an accident. And right there, <laughs> no matter how hard, I just, I just, I just lost it because they, I knew that the accident had passed was them. <laughs> And I felt kind of stupid because I was going to go check and see. My first reaction was, God, please don't let them be dead. <laughs> I'd probably have to be in a psych ward if they had died. Miraculously, Sandra had suffered no broken bones, only minor cuts and bruises. Her father, Popo Campos, was hospitalized for nine days with a compressed fracture in his back and nerve damage to his right side. When I finally got out of the car, I felt so thankful. Rich can I see the appreciation that that one person has. I still do really believe that what saved these people was he saw it coming, he wanted to push her down, he pushed her down enough, and in the process he had laid himself down and he saved his own life. And had he been sitting straight up and he hadn't seen that coming, he wouldn't be around. This big truck just came on us and my dad just saw it and I did it. I think it was scary. I am so grateful to those people who were there to just dig the sand out. You know, if I could be face to face with every single one of those people, I would just say thank you so much for taking care of my husband and my daughter, people you didn't even know and weren't even sure were alive. Next. Uh, the bank is being robbed. You fear for these people. If this guy is going to rob a bank during the day with a gun, he'll do anything. Sir. Oftentimes, in order to solve a crime, police rely on tips from the public. But on February 6, 1991, in Jacksonville, Florida, bank teller Brenda Morris discovered that some people will push the boundaries of safety to try to help police catch a criminal. I don't have that kind of money. I turned around and I saw Lynn with a customer. Lynn had just got there. She'd only been working with us for about a week. I'm gonna shoot her. He made the remark to Lynn, 
that he wouldn't kill me. He would shoot me, so I would ask her, why did I let it happen? Don't look at me. Jacksonville Sheriff's Dispatcher Robert Tolan handled the call. And if he had a gun, it increased the chances of anyone in the bank being shot. And that was the last thing I wanted to hear in my ear, you know, was a gunshot going off, you know, while this guy was in the bank robbing it. You won't pass out. Just this guy just kept repeating to me, this is what I do for a living. This is my job. Just relax and breathe deep. And I kept saying, I can't. I can't. Andy Franklin happened to stop by the bank at the same time to cash a check. I was wondering why he hadn't moved up to the window because there was three windows open. And the girl, she says, please don't shoot me. I just work here. So I figured this guy cannot realize that I'm here. And I thought if this guy turns around, sees me with my phone, he's going to think I'm a cop. He's going to shoot me. So I backed up. Now empty your drawer into that bag. We had a telephone right on the back of the station, and I could see that it was going underneath the station, so I knew somebody was on the phone. And mean? I thought that this guy was going to see the same thing I was seeing. At that point, I got really scared. Thank you. Wayne Carter was making a deposit with the teller at the bank's drive through window. And as I was leaving, she blew her breath into the mic, and she mouthed the words, were being robbed. She didn't want to let on to him that she had told me anything, and I didn't want to let on that she had. Hello? I'm still here. I'm not going to leave you. Okay, don't argue. No, I'm not Yes, I'm at the bank on Santa Boulevard. I think it's being robbed. Hey, do you see anything going on? Do you see anybody in there? One of the girls at the bank here is with me. Dispatcher Heather Spearman took the second call. I was sitting next to Robert and knew that a bank was being robbed at that time. He was pretty wired. Uh, I'm on a mobile phone. Uh, the bank at Hartley Road and Santa Boulevard is being robbed. I don't know if he's gone. I'm scared to look up. Okay, you don't have to look up if you're not scared. I want you to stay safe, okay? That's the most important thing. I'm still here. I'm not going to leave you. Okay, one of the girls at the bank here is with me. I told her, you can't go in the bank. And she says, well, I work here. And I says, well, I know, but you can't go in the bank. The bank is being robbed. Sir? Wait, wait. Do you know he's if he's got a gun? He's coming out. Sir? Sir? She was getting hysterical. He looked over at us, and I thought, boy, I'm going to get shot because of her, because she's hysterical here. Okay, he, he's gone out the door. What, what is he wearing? What is he wearing? He just robbed the bank. He's sir, walking out. He's got a white jacket on. A tell white me, hat. sir, listen to me. He's a, what color shirt? He's, he did have a gun. He told me he was Blue jeans. He told the girl at the uh, counter he would shoot her. Just a second, I'll tell you where he's going. Yeah, you fear for these people going after these suspects because you've got a lot of wannabe police officers. If this guy is going to rob a bank during the day with a gun, he'll do anything. It, what would stop him from firing a bullet? Nothing. At that particular time, I just watched to see where he went and what he did. I was looking to see if he ran across the parking lot any place, and I didn't see anyone. And then as I reached the end of the office building, I looked into the bushes. He looked right at me. I just casually looked over there and pretended like it was just something that didn't concern me. He 
he's going across the parking lot. Let me, I'll fumble him. Sir! Your adrenaline is going 100 miles an hour. And you're trying to figure out what's going on. Sir! Yes. Where is he now? He's going across the parking lot. He's getting into a car. I'm afraid for this guy because he's out in full plain view. If he can see this guy, obviously this guy can see him talking on a phone. operator i'm following yes, the uh you're following the suspect, following the suspect. he's in a blue uh -huh. and he's getting in he's fixing to leave he's he has a blue on what a, blue what he's in a blue a what blue osmobile it looks like with a white white top you got a tag number i can't see him i don't have any weapon or anything okay, I'm where, where did it happen at where did this he's pulling out beside me now i'll try to get the tag number as he goes by just a second sir where did that where did it hold happen? on a minute okay That's a Mississippi tag. One, A is an apple, N, V, five, nine, one. Five, nine, one. He's pulling out towards San Jose Boulevard from the shopping center. Okay, just one second. That's Mississippi tag? Yes, the Mississippi tag. Sir, see anything else? Okay, the hat and the jacket are here. Which way is he going? Uh, he's still in the shopping center. If you can get a policeman in here, I've got way, him, sir. but I don't have anything to stop him with. Stay on the line and be very quiet. Okay. Here's your policeman right now. Okay, just a second, sir. All right, I've got him. He's right here. Tell his man to turn in. Right here. Right here. Hey! 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 Here. I just saw a blue car take out and go down this way. The car, he dropped the hat. Sir, are the police there with police you? Police are here with me. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Among the officers who responded was Sheriff's Deputy Henry Skinner. He made like he was getting off as a regular stop, and I got the microphone, PA mic in my hand to tell him to put his hands on the windshield, and I never got it out. He kind of caught me off guard, and at that point, the complexion of the situation changed completely. It went from cool and calm into where this guy's going to hurt somebody, and he doesn't care who he's going to hurt. Motorcycle officer Tom Buck joined the chase. I'm just wanting to get it over with because he's starting to scare me. He starts uh, fumbling around under the seat. And I, I know from my experience that at 100 miles an hour, he's not looking for his driver's license and his vehicle registration. So I made a decision at that time that I was going to shoot. come back on again. The vehicle comes to a stop. I was mad. I was scared. This was fast. This was pumped up. You know, he was wanting to hurt me. You in the car. Put your hand down the car. And it didn't matter who, who got in his way. The suspect was subsequently convicted of armed robbery and aggravated assault and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Nearly two years later, the people who got involved that day finally got a chance to meet each other. And to me, it was great. You know, it's like everybody worked together. Everything just happened to click. So he was doomed from the start, it seems like. <laughs> Don't put yourself in danger. Do what you think you need to do to help the police. 
but never put yourself in danger. It's not worth it. It's not your money. No amount of money in the world is worth your life. <laughs> Next. We need to get him cooled down because he was over 106 degrees Fahrenheit. The next thing that went was his heart. What sets some hospitals apart from the rest is the deep understanding the staff has of the fears and anxiety that patients and their loved ones experience. This story is not a recreation. It's a look inside a very special medical facility in New York City where the best prescription for pain is a unique combination of skill and compassion. An injured patient arrives by taxi at the Animal Medical Center. People's pets, they're not just possessions, they're really members of the family. And when people call me on the telephone, they'll say, I'm Oscar's mother, or I'm Cuckoo's father. Hey, what exactly happened to your pig? Um, we were giving him a bath, and his, um, one of his back hooves snapped. Yeah. Well, um, how much has it been bleeding since? A lot. It's a been lot? bleeding a lot. Okay, a doctor will be in to have a look at your pig in just a few minutes. You just have to be ready for anything because you don't know what's going to come in. And who is this? Dr. Lori Heath examines Ned, the pot-bellied pig. And did he hit it on the edge of the tub? Oh, um, no, I think he put his weight on it weird when he got in. Okay, why don't we get him up on the table? Anytime you try to handle a pig, they'll squeal and they'll squeal loudly. If you're going to do this on a regular basis, work with pigs, you really need to wear earplugs or your hearing can be affected. He had indeed ripped his whole nail off his claw. All right. I thought that we should have a surgeon look at it to determine whether or not he had the bone exposed underneath. You big ham. That's what you are. When I saw Ned coming down the corridor, someone tempting him to walk down with party mix, I knew he was going to be difficult to handle. I tried to pet him, call his name, but he was just not going to have anything to do with anything. Hi, Ned. Hi, Ned. I tried to look at him on his level and on his terms. Boy. One person was at one end working on his foot while I was at the other end feeding him. He could have cared less about what we were doing as long as he had his party mix. Well, there was every indication that a new nail would grow back on its own as long as we could keep the open area clean. And you don't want the infection to get in the bone because then it's going to lose the toe anyways and it can become a systemic infection and it'll never heal. So we're in a grace period, it's contaminated but probably not infected yet. Flush it real good and start them on a systemic antibiotic for pigs. When Chloe, a nine-month-old Bichon Frise who ingested some poison, is brought in, Director of Counseling, Susan Cohen, goes to speak with her owner. I was told that there was a very distraught woman with a sick dog and that she needed help. Okay, what's she going on? I don't know the nature. She, I, she was fine. I got home at 5.30. I had left her all day. On the wood floor, I had used a cleaning substance. She probably licked it up. I just thought that she was going to die. Okay, deep breathe, okay? Yeah, that's a ticket. That's good. That's good. That's a ticket. Doctor's here. She's gonna say, "What's your dog's name?" Chloe. Chloe. Hey, Chloe. He's sweet thing. It's of course human nature to be upset when somebody you love appears to be getting sick and maybe dying, or has maybe consumed poison. I mean, all of us would be upset. Uh huh. No, no. I think you did exactly the right thing. You know, you, you came right in with her as soon as you saw something going on. You looked at the right stuff. You know, you're obviously a real devoted person. Tell me what your name is. 
Susan Cohen was right there, and she tried to comfort me um, while Chloe was taken. And um, it was good that there was someone right there to try to smooth things over. I've been through a lot. I see you. When tests on Chloe are completed, Anne is updated on her condition. So what we're going to do is start her on some fluids into her vein um, to support her overnight. In case they told me that her liver had been attacked by a toxic substance and that Chloe would have to stay in the hospital. But they reassured me that she probably was going to be okay. An injured owl found in a quarry is brought in by a wildlife preservation team. We went out to get him, and uh, by the next day we were noticing that he wasn't looking at things. He was tracking with his ears. So we brought him uh, to a veterinarian, and they established that he had cataracts. Ophthalmologist Susan Kirshner examines the owl to determine the extent of eye damage. All right, little guy. Birds are very, very prone to damage to the retina part of the eye. The only way that I could see his retina was to do an ultrasound of his eyes. See, that face is not supposed to be there, and I'm concerned that that may be, at least in this eye, a detached retina. So let's, let's do the other eye. It's okay, sweetie. The left eye had one small part of the retina that looked as if it was still intact. So I thought that with a little luck, we might be able to restore at least partial vision to one eye. I'm very happy that they had found Bartimaeus because his chances for living in that quarry would have been nothing. Within two hours of being brought in, Ned the pig is ready to go home. We flushed it with an uh, antiseptic solution and put a bandage around it. He should come back tomorrow for a 24-hour recheck and let us evaluate it at that time. It pretty much stopped bleeding, and I don't think you'll have a problem with it. Okay. Well, you, I'm sure you guys will probably order lots of party mix now. Some days are very sad, and you're an emotional roller coaster constantly. So when something nice happens or something funny and comic, it's always nice, especially when it turns out so well. Arnold, a five-year-old English bulldog, is rushed into the emergency room. He was having so much difficulty breathing, and he was starting to turn a little blue. Dr. Laurie Gordon is in charge of his care. He collapsed just as we got him back to the prep room. Somebody getting a mask? Is he breathing at all? Let's get him intubated. Get me a line, laryngoscope. Dave, you got it in? Yeah, it's in. Let's get some nice cool yeah. fluids. Let's get a bag of... Uh, we need to get him cooled down because he was over 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you get a bowl of cold water while you're that? Can I have another bag of fluids, please? Despite our getting oxygen into him as soon as possible, mm -hmm. the next thing that went was his heart. We tried cardiac resuscitation to try to start the heart again. Is he getting off? Okay, get another line. Chair, stand up. Any pulses? Is he get anything getting through? As the medical team fights to revive Arnold, one of the veterinarians reports back on his talk with the dog's owner. So she said to, to call, it, uh, call it when you think you've done the appropriate uh, steps. Let's, let's wait on the opening. Okay. Uh, come on, pal. We could not get a normal rhythm back. You got a pulse? No. Got anything. I think so. Nothing. He's fixed and dilated. After working on Arnold for 20 minutes, doctors pronounce him dead. We literally say goodbye. Goodbye, Arnold, pet him, and mentally wish him well. Just like a human. No one, no one likes to lose a patient. That's not, I'm afraid, Miss Tate. Uh, what? I'm afraid we, we, we he's couldn't. Dead? He's dead. He's yeah. dead? He's died. Yeah. It's not just the animal, it's the person who owns them, too. There's a lot of emotion involved. The car started to breathe real quick. He's dead. These are best friends. These are creatures who give love back unconditionally. 
They're always there to love you. It won't be too tough for us to know whether he can see better. Dr. Kirshner performs the delicate eye surgery on Bartimaeus the owl. This bird has had some trauma to the inside of the eye so that there are some a lot more little rips and tears than usual, so I'm gonna have to kind of work around those. It was a long surgery because he had some other damage in his eye that we had to take care of. Uh, birds have very different cataracts in texture, like curdled milk, and it makes it a little bit more difficult than it would be in another species. We were just going for that small chance that we could give him a little bit of sight. Even if he is not able to see well enough to go completely free, I'm at least optimistic that he will see light and dark and will be able to, to see the sun and, uh, and we'll basically just follow him from here. He's hanging in there. He's a good, strong bird. Hello? Hi, Barbara. Yes. Down the hall, Susan calls Barbara Tate to comfort her on the loss of her bulldog, Arnold. Yeah. I, um, I heard about Arnold, and I just called to see how you're doing. Yeah, I'm, you know, I am doing okay. I'm, um, depressed. <laughs> depressed, yeah. Depressed, yeah, yeah, I found that... I'm what Barbara needed was to talk in great detail about what happened. I think to try to figure out how Arnold, whom she loved very much, got to be dead. Your guard was down a little, right? Because you weren't really prepared for anything very bad to happen. Oh, no, I was, I was... Totally taken aback. I didn't think it's nice to, to, to have somebody understand that it's it's really like a member of your family. Dog. I've had dogs over the years, and he was the sweetest dog I ever had. He was also the dumbest. <laughs> I think. And unless you have somebody you can talk to that's lost a pet, that loved a pet, people that, that don't have pets just think you're nuts. You miss Arnold. When she was a little tiny puppy, Arnold just fell in love. You care? Arnold thought we had brought home a little wind-up toy for him to play with. And so Arnold just followed the dog around the house wherever he went. We were a little worried because Arnold was such a, so big and clumsy, I thought he was going to step on her. So sometimes we would lock her up in the crate just to keep her safe. And Arnold would just lay on his belly outside the crate and look moon-faced at this dog. Arnold was unique. No dog was ever like Arnold. He was just so sweet. After two days in the hospital, Chloe has recovered enough to be released. I did, did miss her dearly, yeah. so... Oh, Chloe! Oh, Chloe, honey! Oh, oh, mm -hmm. Are you okay? Look at me. Chloe, do you recognize me? I've grown very, very attached to her. She's like a child. She relies on me for everything, so you feel very needed. Yeah, you're wagging your tail. Give me a kiss. It's unfortunate to have the animal hospital in New York City. I know if the animal hospital weren't here, I, I don't know if Chloe would have survived. Six days after Ned injured his foot, he's healed enough to once again enjoy the things he loves most. Occasionally we'll take him out for a walk and he'll graze and whatever. He's found some grass, sure. He's very affectionate and he likes people a lot. <laughs> Just me having him around. <laughs> he's always getting in stuff and uh, always has to be on my lap if I'm sitting down. He's my baby. <laughs> We have a very powerful response to animals. They're completely accepting of us. Uh, they're never going to get up and read our diary to the whole fifth grade class. They're never going to make us stand in the corner because we flunked algebra. They're never going to take the car away because we put a dent in it. They think we are terrific exactly the way we are. And I wish I had a dollar for every person who sat across from me and said, this is the only person in my whole life who has ever really loved me just the way I am. Next. Death, yes, I got a baby that's choking. There's not a feeling in the world to describe the terror that I was feeling. I thought I was going to lose her that day for sure. Most of us would do anything to protect the people we care about most. 
But on the afternoon of June 5, 1992, at her home in Indianapolis, Indiana, Lisa Smith found out that love is not always enough to keep them safe. I babysit for Mindy and Melanie during the week. And on this particular day, I have my four children and the babies. After they got done with lunch, I brought the two babies in the house and sent the older kids on out to play. Who's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. The Grover. Ah! Where? I don't see no dog. Ah! Mindy said that she had the potty. You gotta go potty? We started potty training about two or three months. And as a reward, I always, you know, gave Mindy a sucker. Good girl. Look what you get for going on the potty. Yeah, sucker. Get this if you want. Good. Good. Indianapolis Fire and EMS. Yes, yes, I got a baby that's choking. She's choking on the sucker. She's okay, okay ma'am, calm down. What is your address? 308 North. Is that a house or an apartment? It's a, it's a, it's a double. It's a double? Yes. Okay, is the baby still conscious? Yes, I, she's choking, she's choking. Okay, ma'am. Okay, hold on the phone. I'm going to dispatch somebody. Okay. Carol Wash had been an Indianapolis Fire EMS dispatcher for three years. My insides were just going crazy. You have four to six minutes to do what you're going to do. And after that, it's real touchy. I'm going to tell you, let me get someone dispatched and on the way, okay? okay? Stay on the phone. I had to tell her to hang on for a second while I got the units going. And I felt bad about that, but I thought, at least I've got help on the way in case I can't help her. Medic 2, rescue engine 12, the child choking, 1412. Location 5000 East, 308 North. How is she breathing? Is she breathing normally? Just, no, she's, she's just... Okay, calm down, calm down. Is she turning blue or anything? Yes! Okay, she's not able to cry or anything? No! Okay. There's not a feeling in the world to describe the terror that I was feeling. I felt like it was my fault. I love her like she was just my own. And uh, I thought I was going to lose her that day for sure. Okay. You need to stay calm. It was the first time I was going to have to use the emergency medical dispatch cards, so I was nervous. Okay, what do you think she's choking on? A sucker. A sucker? A sucker, yes. She bit into a baby sucker. Okay. Okay, I'm going to tell you what to do for the baby, okay? Is she right there with you? Yes. Okay, remove the clothing from the baby's chest. Okay. Okay, pick her up. Yes. Turn the baby face down. Yes. So she's lying along your forearm. Is yes, she got it. small enough for that? Yes. Support her jaw in your hand. Uh-huh. Okay, the bottom should be held between your elbow and hip. Uh -huh. It's real nerve-wracking not to be able to see the person who's in trouble. You just have to take someone's word for it over the phone. And that's, that's scary and dangerous. Okay, now you've got all that? You've got her in that yes. position? Yes. Okay, tilt the baby with the head down slightly. Uh-huh. Use the heel of your hand uh -huh. to strike her back four times, right between the shoulder blades. Oh, there it comes. Oh, God, there comes the sucker. Oh, God. On the fourth thrust, the sucker just flew out of her mouth. I was just so elated that she was, she was alive, you know. She's not choking? Did the sucker come up? Yes. Great, great. How is she doing now? Is she crying? She's just, she's just real dazed. Is she getting any air? Can you see her chest yes. rising? Yes. Okay, oh great. All right, just lay the baby down. The Keep her real here. still. The ambulance is here. Okay, ma'am, great. Okay. Uh-huh, bye-bye. I'd never saved anyone over the phone, so it was a new experience for me. And I sat back in my chair, and then I looked around the room, and I said, I just had a save. Within three minutes of the call, the Indianapolis Fire Rescue Unit was on the scene led by Mark Oster. When we arrived, I had one of the firefighters check out the baby, and there was no visible injury. Yeah. 
just turned all blue. Right? She started to cry quite loudly, so we knew everything was completely fine with the baby at that point. <laughs> The sucker had become lodged in Mindy's throat when the stick it was on broke. I had no idea that a sucker could be so dangerous after this experience. I don't allow them in my house. I don't allow my older children <laughs> to have suckers, period. I already knew CPR, but I didn't know the Heimlich maneuver for infants. I think that's something that every babysitter, every mother in the world should know. The Cox family is thankful for Lisa Smith's action that day. I think she did great. And to tell you the truth, I think she was the only babysitter we had in a long time that I trust. Wide it in. Go get a bike. Wide it in. Go get a bike, Daddy. If it wasn't for the 911 system and Carol Walsh, Mindy would not be here today. I love Mindy to death. She's the sweetest little girl, and just to see her up running around and playing and normal every day, it's a wonderful feeling. Give me a kiss, Mandy. Give me a kiss. Mm -hmm. Love me. Is the baby breathing? In many communities, Emergency dispatchers are not trained or even legally allowed to give first aid instructions. With support from you, more communities will find ways to train their dispatchers to provide life-saving information over the phone. This series is dedicated to all the men, women, and children who aid and comfort us during times of trouble. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next time for more true stories on Rescue 911.